Welcome to Samson's Strength Coach Collective. I'm your host, Matt Thomas, and I'm joined by Angie Brandley-Moyer of Princeton University. She's the Associate Head Strength and Condition Coach. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing good. Doing good. Always a good day to record a podcast and talk some shop. So <laughs> Angie great. has been with Princeton for almost 20 years now. She works with women's soccer, volleyball, men's hockey, women's basketball, soccer, and women's lacrosse. So for those who are not familiar, could you please share a little bit about your background? Sure. Um, well, I come from a family of athletes. Um, I am my father's daughter, so um, I was a four-sport athlete in high school. And I have an older brother, and my dad was very involved in coaching. He was a football coach, a wrestling coach, a baseball coach, all the things. And he started off his football program with this program called Bigger, Faster, Stronger. It's a very old school weightlifting philosophy. And I decided one day I went to him and I said, I would like to start training. And we had some equipment down in our basement and he built squat rack and all those things. And he, I started training with him. And when I got into high school sports, I just continued that training and track and field. We trained as a team a little bit. Um, and I, was kind of in love with the aspect of training. I would, would have considered myself like an A athlete in the sense where I, like, I worked hard, but I was not a elite, naturally talented, gifted athlete. It was just always something I had to work hard for. And that's just who my father was. My father was like an undersized athlete as well. So, um, you know, I fell in love with strength and conditioning and when I chose my college degree, I knew I wanted to work in with athletes. I didn't know it was called strength and conditioning. And when I was at the University of Pittsburgh, I was part of the exercise science program. The director of the program came in and said, uh, the football strength and conditioning coach is looking for interns. And I was like, that's me. That's what I want to do exactly. And Buddy Morris was the head football strength and conditioning coach at the University of Pittsburgh at the time. So I went down there knowing nothing really about strength and conditioning as a, phil a philosophical approach to it. So we would sit around with VHS tapes and watch VHS, VHS tapes of West Side Barbell. And I mean, I was just blown away. Like I just, I didn't have experience with Olympic lifting or anything. I just lifted weights, more of a strength-based type of thing. So it was Buddy Morris who really kind of opened my eyes to what weightlifting really was and then um, he brought me, he introduced me to Kim King, who was also at the University of Pittsburgh, and she worked with, she was the director of all the other Olympic sports. So I just kind of started there at the University of Pittsburgh, interning with them. Tim Belts was there. I learned a lot from him. And it was Tim that said, if you want to get into strength and conditioning, you know, you need to do a graduate assistantship. And then I, and I end, ended up at Temple University. And that brought me to this side of the state. I'm in Pennsylvania. And, you know, after my graduate assistantship, within the year, I got the job at Princeton. That was my first, you know, I was like working at a, a sports training facility, kind of like not even a full year in between. And then once I got the job at Princeton, here I am. Um, I'm in my 17th year at Princeton University. So Princeton has made it a career for me. I have grown as a professional at Princeton. Um, and it, it was and is a very valuable experience. I know I'm one of very few strength and conditioning coaches that stayed at the same place for so long. It all started in the basement, just slinging some weights around. I love it. Mm -hmm. And then kind of moving forward to getting into college SNC, it's all about getting that one in. And for you, all it took was one with that graduate assistantship and look at you now. So <laughs> very cool story. First big question, what is the coolest story you have thus far in your career? This was a tough one when I read the list of questions that you had for me. Um, I, I will first start by saying that it was, I was hard to pick something where I was just like, oh, this stuck out of my career. I mean, I work, have worked with multiple sports at Princeton University, not just the ones that you've mentioned. As we grow with staff, we've shifted who's worked with what teams. And it's really, you know, I talk about the small wins, like the small wins every day in the weight room are really what's most important to me. And then when the athletes graduate and hearing from them after. Um, Princeton has a reunions every year and it's a very special thing unique to Princeton where they bring back alumni, you know, like 55, 50, 60 years of alumni. And every fifth year is kind of like the massive celebration. So like your fifth, your 10th, you know, your 15th and your 20th, like they celebrate those years, but you can come back every year and experience 
this reunions event. And it's just, you know, seeing all the athletes over the years and them seeing me and, you know, coming up to me and be like, Angie, look at my squat depth, you know, and, and just, the excitement that I, I see in their faces when they see me, because I'm like, oh, I thought you hated me when I was training you. Um, and like, those are the things that are most important to me. I mean, I, I'm a teacher and, you know, like, it's not about me, it's about them. So if I had a positive effect in their lives, that's really what is most important. That being said, there are a few, a few like sports mo moments that you know, like really stick out in my mind. And, and this is why we do what we do. I mean, you know, our football team went 10 and 0 like a year ago and, you know, and they're one double A, but they're that they got a national ranking, um, you know, but you know, my ECA, like the hockey team, you know, winning ECAC championships while I was there and, and they were spread out like 10 years apart almost. So that's, that was very important to me. Um, our women's basketball team in 2015 went 30 and 0 in the regular season, and you know that was a big deal, and we got you know nationally recognized for that. And you know then we went to the NCAA tournament as a 13th seed and played Green Bay and actually and beat them, and that was the first NCAA win for Princeton women's basketball. So that was important. All while Barack Obama was in the stands because his niece plays played on the was a sophomore on the basketball team at the time. Um, so it was just a very exciting moment for Princeton women's basketball, and it was a very special special team. And then, then the next sports moment I would say that really sticks out in my mind is our 2017 women's soccer team. Um, we went into the NCAA tournament. You know seated lower than our counterparts, but we went in, we made it to the round of 32 and UNC, University of North Carolina was hosting the tournament. So we go down to North Carolina and we were up against NC State the first game. So the round of 32, we had already beaten NC State in the earlier in the season to nothing. Um, but, you know, it's always hard to be like, yeah, we beat NC State. They still have a higher ranking than us. Um, and now we have to beat them a second time. So, you know, it was a, we're, ma we were matched up physically and, and skills wise pretty much with them. And we went into this game and it was a hard fought match the whole time. And it ended up being like, you know, one, one after regulation. And then we went into two overtimes and it was still one, one. So we go to a shootout and a lot of the women on the team have never been in a shootout, even in their, their soccer careers, like in their whole lives, like, oh my gosh, we're going to shoot out. We, we, how does this work? Coach, tell me how this works. And I mean, I didn't know how it worked. I just, I mean, I know that it goes to penalty kicks, but, um, and we ended up winning that shootout 5-4. So that was awesome. I mean, it was like a, you know, storm the field type of thing. And then, you know, a day later, two days later, I think it was two days later, we ended up playing UNC, who was seated second in the whole NCAA tournament. And obviously we're like down on their home territory and we're playing this game and they're warming up and like, I'm looking at, NC, I mean, UNC, and I'm thinking, wow, like, I mean, these kids were very polished with finesse. I mean, you know, like the ball, like they stop it as soon as it comes to them. I'm just like watching the warm up. I'm like, oh, this is going to get tough. And, you know, I mean, it was the possession, ball possession definitely went to UNC the whole game. I mean, it, I mean, we were running around, but our kids were grinders. Like it, it was just that year of like that we had, like our seniors on that team, they grinded. I mean, they were pushers they were hard and you know I mean you know UNC get the ball pass it like we're you know running around doing a lot more like work output than UNC was doing um but after regulation it was 1-1 <laughs> so we're going to overtime again and I mean this was like an amazing experience and at this point we go to overtime and the team is saying like nobody scores on us like nobody's scoring on us because you know this is sudden victory you know first goal wins the game and you know we're going back and forth and we're pushing I mean we're still pushing but UNC is getting tired at that this point I mean so are we but like their finesse is dropping a little bit and we're still grinding 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 and one of our seniors drops the ball over to like one of our rookies and she pokes that ball in and we win that game and the team sprints out and we end up beating like the second seed to go on to like the round of eight and and that was something where i was just like wow like just this is why we do what we do and i know i kind of was long-winded here but i mean you know we do this because we want to have those moments and I, you know i was just happy to be a part of that
and with those program specific games, successes, victories, because of the time you spent at Princeton, you've been able to see those progressions of programs of entire senior classes and things like that. But what I want to ask about specifically is the reunion you mentioned at the beginning, how it's not, oh, do you remember my PR? Do you remember when I hit that one lift? Like you said, you're an educator. It's like in my squad depth. It's look at all the, the laughs and the awesome times we've had. And, and I'm sure a lot of those conversations are the not exercise weight specific things that you guys accomplish, but all of the kind of outside the weight room or outside the rack kind of um, kind of stuff that you guys have accomplished together during during your time. So I bet that reunion is an awesome time just to catch up and, and reminisce. It's amazing. And this was obviously like COVID-19 canceled it this year. I mean, this is the first time and I think since one of the world wars that they didn't have it. <laughs> so it, it was, you know, that's was de this de COVID-19 has devastated a lot of things. But um, yes, I mean, reunions is a very special time and Princeton is a very special place. <laughs> Fantastic. So moving on to the next question. Coach Angie has quite her own athletic career from professional rugby to an Olympic weightlifting title to dabbling a little bit of CrossFit. So how important is it to you to have your own athletic career slash your own pursuits? And how has it helped you connect with your athletes if it makes you more relatable, if it shows that you practice what you preach? Or do you think that kind of your own stuff should, should kind of just remain to yourself? Um, it wasn't a secret that I was doing all those things. And I'm a walk the walk type of coach. And that's just, it's, it's very important to me um, to stay in the game. And I think that it definitely helped buy in, especially with the male athletes that I was training. I mean, I'm a woman and I work in a man's world. Um, and I think, I definitely believe that you know, me still being a competitive athlete as, I mean, I'm not going to tell everybody what my age is, but um, over the years. <laughs> and I, I mean, it's definitely helped me. I, I think it does create a lot of relatability. And that's important when you're trying to sell anything. Like if you're a salesperson, really relatability is what gets you in the door. So I believe it did create relatability to me. Um, I wasn't, I like, well, when I first went to college, I went to a division to like, I went to a branch campus at the University of Pittsburgh, University of Pittsburgh at Johnstown, um, their, their division two school. And I, and I did dabble in track and field, but I discovered rugby my freshman year. <laughs> and I kind of, it was just like, I, I fell in love with that sport um, and kind of dropped the varsity sport title and went to a club sport. And I, and I think that, you know, when I first, you know, got the job at Princeton, it was kind of like, is this person going to know how to, what it's like to be a varsity athlete and, you know, coach, not, not having been a varsity athlete and, you know, coach what we're doing along with like all the other things that are going on because I was a club sport. I mean, I chose when I wanted to go to practice. I mean, I obviously went and it was very important to me. I, like I'm that person, but um, I, you know, I didn't have a coach bring anything down my neck, you know, like varsity athletes do, or saying, this is what your schedule is going to be. And this is when you show up on time and all these things. Like, so, um, I didn't have the same experience as, as like a college varsity athlete as, you know, being a club sport. Um, so I think that, but, you know, me being an, in a competitive sport, as I got later into my career, and I still maintained a full-time job being, you know, competitive in some different kinds of sports, I think it does create buy-in, and, and I think it is important, um, and, you know, like I said in the beginning, I mean, I do walk the walk, and, you know, when I discover a new program, I'm like, I'm not going to read a program out of the book, <laughs> you know, the way I'm going to do it is I'm actually going to do the program, and, and I obviously, you know, would give the, that advice to everybody, but um, I would much rather, you know, have somebody say, okay, like I want to do five, three, one, or I want to do some triphasic. And I'm like, okay, the way I'm going to learn this is by doing it. So that's just how I learn. Um, I learn by doing. And um, so, you know, I, you know, that kind of relates to the whole athletic thing. Like, it, you know, me learning what it's like to have college life and also play competitive sport is like me having a full-time job and being competitive in a sport. And with the relatability and creating that buy-in, not only the six sports you work with currently, but also all of the other sports that you've worked with in your career, not everyone can play those sports in general, let alone at a super competitive collegiate level the, themselves. But showing that you have your own pursuits, that you're playing those sports, that, you're, that you do your own programs, that 
that you're also an athlete too, it's an easy way to create relatability without having been there, done that specifically to that sport. And it's going to go a long way with that athlete as well. So not that you have to join a rec league of whatever sport you're coaching, just you're doing something specifically your own programs. Cause that's, that's what you're coaching, but just showing that you are an athlete, you're a human, you have your own pursuits and you can be competitive and that you get it just a little bit more than they would think otherwise. Definitely. Yeah. I am. Um, I've had three ACL tears in my rugby career <laughs> and it started when I was a graduate assistant and I've had two ACL tears when I was at Princeton university, like via rugby and they were all contact injuries, but um, yeah, I've come back th from three major knee surgeries. So you know, and that's a very, that's a season ending injury. <laughs> that's a, that could be a career ending injury. So it, you know, in the sense of not just, you know, me playing the sport and having being able bodied to play, but also relating to athletes that have gotten injured, like me having a real understanding of what it's like to have that kind of a devastating injury. And also, you know, also saying that I've had this injury, I've had these surgeries, and I've still gone in back and played, and I've recovered from these injuries, and I'm still competitive. So it doesn't have to be, you know, it could be a college careers ending injury, but it doesn't have to be like a lifetime career ending injury. So, um, I mean, it depends on what sport that you're doing. So I, like, I think that not only just, you know, the athleticism part of it, but, you know, having been injured and coming back from injury, definitely like gives makes it a little bit more relatable and gives some athletes a shoulder to cry on when it says and I can honestly say like I know what you're going through yeah and honestly kind of like you just said vulnerability whatever term we want to use but showing that you're more similar to them than dissimilar in whatever fashion it may be like I said we all can't play all the sports that we coach but whatever you can do on your own to help kind of bridge that gap in the athlete's mind that you are more similar than dissimilar, I think would 100% be worth your time that you've seen pay off for yourself. So very cool. Next question, being at Princeton since 03 and the associate head since 2017, could you share what it's like to see that progression of the department over the over almost 20 years? And then within that progression, kind of a two-part question, what is the SNC field done well and should continue doing? And um, over this time period, what do you think that the field hasn't done and that they can start doing? Um, well, it, I, our program did grow. It started out with myself and our current now director of performance, Jason Gallucci. It was just two of us. Princeton had 38 varsity sports at the time, and we only trained 12 of them. So he had six of them and I had six of them, but it was him and I in the weight room. And although I had my six and he had his six, I mean, football was his team, one of his teams. And that's, like three teams. So I assisted with football and I also assisted with his other teams when he was with football. So it, it went from us to, you know, we slowly, we, over the years, about four and a half, five years into my time at Princeton, we grew to a staff of four in the sense where we had another full-time staff and then a part-time staff. Um, and then we got a new AD and um, our new AD you know, was very supportive of the growth of our program. And um, I mean, now we've added, now we're, we're in a very short time, we're up to six strength and conditioning staff. So, and now we're training every, all the athletes. So once we added, you know, the four strength, you know, the two additional, aside from my, Jason and myself, we increased the number of teams that we were training and we still weren't training all of them. So now we are at the point where our staff does train all the varsity, all the varsity sports actually, and some club sports. Um, but, you know, as personnel wise, we definitely increase the number. And, and that's, a, that's a very important, important thing. I mean, I, I want to say long gone are the days of working 12 hour days, you know, Monday through Friday, and then, you know, weekend games and whatnot. I can't say that's gone. I don't think it is. I think it still stands. I mean, I still work 10 hour days. Um, and like, that's a tough thing. But you know, we're slowly but surely, you know, growing as a field. <laughs> we're growing and I, athletic directors and administration are seeing value in what we do. Coaches are definitely seeing value in what we do. So I would say personnel at Princeton was our biggest change. And as we increase in personnel, I mean, we brought on sports nutrition, we brought on sports psychology, we brought on leadership. And, you know, when I got the position as associate head, um, Jason Gallucci was our director at the time. He actually got that 
director of performance position, and then he moved to a position, moving to a position that he didn't train any teams. So then we hired, like then we had to hire, make some more hires. Um, and you know, having a director of performance is a new thing, and and it's very important that Jason is in this position because he's a voice for strength and conditioning. I mean, he definitely connects athletic medicine and nutrition and, and the whole, everything that has to do with performance, you know, in the athletic department when it comes to physical and mental performance. But, you know, you don't necessarily have to be a former strength and conditioning coach to have that position, but I think it's very valuable that he is because he's a voice for like who we are. And he's a voice for growing our numbers. He's a voice for our strength coaches shouldn't be working 12 hour days you know, getting paid $40,000, like that kind of thing, you know, I mean, and I think it's important as these director of performance positions like grow in the field. So this kind of goes into your second question. We, we need to continue the growth of these tenured strength and conditioning coaches that, you know, want to get to be more administrative to have a voice and to create, you know, and these director of performance positions be created um, so they can assist in strength and conditioning and still have their hands in the game when it comes to, you know, being on the floor and all those type of things. Um, so, you know, go, moving on to your second half of your question, we've grown in, as a profession, we've grown in a lot of ways. We've gotten smarter, our certifications. I mean, the, you know, Collegiate Strength and Conditioning Coaches Association, I mean, it was established when I was, you know, first kind of getting into the field as a full-time professional, but it's really established, established itself over the years and even the way that they do like their certification process, those types of things I need, think need to continually evolve moving forward. I, I would love to see this and I don't know the details that going, going into this actually happening, but I would love to see strength and conditioning coaches have some sort of license, you know, like a licensed strength and conditioning coach. So, you know, you don't just get a certification and quote on, you know, take a test and, you know, say, okay, I'm a strength and conditioning coach. Um, and I think that, you know, like athletic medicine has a license and I don't even know if this is possible, but I would love to see this happen because then it's going to like narrow the field of, you know, who can actually call themselves a strength and conditioning coach. And there's a lot of coaches out there that don't have sort of like strength and conditioning certifications that are great coaches. And I'm not going to minimize that, but for the safety of our profession, I believe that it's important for us to kind of move in that direction if we can. Um, you know, I know that Don Decker created, you know, this protocol for, you know, return to play, you know, return to the weight room, return to conditioning. I mean, that, that is an amazing start that he has done and him and his committee have done. And we need to be, move more in that direction because we want to protect our field. And, you know, I, I keep comparing ourselves to athletic medicine, but athletic medicine is taking over our field in some ways. I mean, they, they are, you know, Athletic medicine is a direct report, <laughs> is our direct reports at some universities. And I, you know, I, I don't necessarily think that that should be the case. I think that we should work together as a team and we should, you know, have a lot of correspondence, but I don't think that the director of athletic medicine should necessarily be telling us what we can and can't do. But as strength and conditioning coaches, we need to be smart. We need to use our heads. We need to protect athletes. And that's where I think that the licensing process comes in. I mean, I, I think the CSCCA has done a great job with their certification process and it's not just taking a test There's a practical portion. You have to, you have to do an internship. So you actually are doing some sort of internship and in hours underneath the master strength and conditioning coach. All those things are very important. Um, but I think that there's a next step that we need to take where we're starting to like require, you know, certain certifications and, you know, this takes, you know, this takes being a team with the NCAA, which I know that we have done. Um, so it's, it's harder than I'm making it sound, but that's definitely the direction that I would love it to go because I want to protect the field. And, I, and I, we are a very valuable, valuable piece. Um, team around the team is what our athletic director, you know, that's her term. And I, I think she's right. Like we're the team around the team. And, um, but, you know, I don't want us to diminish because we don't all have the same protocols. And I don't think we all have to have the same protocols, but there should be standards. And I'm not, I don't necessarily think everybody's meeting those standards just yet. Definitely some interesting food for thought, kind of just as the field has become more legitimate, 
professional, whatever term we want to use. But we are kind of behind some of the other fields in the officialness, if that's the term we want to use, of the certifications. You know, I mean, we won't even get into the certified personal trainer, but the CSCS, you get a 24 chapter textbook, you have six months to study it, and then you have to pass the test. And you can take it up to, I don't even know, however many times versus some of the extremely extensive uh, certifications for fields like athletic training and things like that, where it is licensed and a, and a little bit more legitimate. But as the field is going that way, definitely some interesting food for thought. But then going back to, to Princeton, the big thing being the increase in personnel, was that mainly driven by you and Jason going to admin saying we need more people? Was it a progressive AD coming in saying, hey, we got to go with the times or kind of how did the increase in personnel start? What was the, the main driver of that? I think it was all the things that you said. I, it started off with saying, you know, Jason as director of strength and conditioning when he was that, him going to the AD at the time saying, we need more personnel and this is why. We're not training all our teams. It also took sport coaches going to the AD and saying, why don't we have a strength and conditioning coach? You know, where is our time in the weight room? those types of things. I mean, we had a lot of sports teams. We had 38 varsity sports. Um, and right now we have, I say it as in past tense, but we have 37 now. We had sprint football and, you know, that we we dropped sprint football. Um, and there's like six teams in the country. So, um, but, and I'm not minimizing sprint football. I'm just saying we went from 30, 37, but, you know, it took a lot of those things. It took Jason going to administration. It, it took coaches saying, hey, coach, like you have a voice. If you want to strengthen conditioning coach, then speak up. And what actually happened was that position, that third full-time position, when I said we went to four, the, the third position after myself, I would say um, that position was funded by, you know, the swimming team and another team. So like teams, like friends groups or booster clubs, we call them friends groups, started funding positions. And that's how, you know, our staff grew. Like, if you want this position, like coaches, like we need strength conditioning, like we'll fund this position. We'll get with another team. We'll fund it. And that's actually how we took on track and field. That's how we took on um, rowing. That's how we took on fencing. So um, some of our positions are actually funded through friends groups of specific teams. And, you know, those coaches that are funded through those specific teams, um, you know, obviously coach those sports and, you know, and just those sports, but it brought new staff uh, for us to work with and to help out and all those things. So um, it, it, and then we had a progressive AD and, and she, you know, sees value in what we do and she's given us some visibility and that's super important too. So I, it was a lot of different things, um, but yes, definitely like speaking up, progressive AD, coaches saying we need we need more strength and conditioning and seeing the value that we actually gave to their team was were all things that contributed to like the growth of our program. There's a lot of awesome lessons in that. Starting with a closed mouth doesn't get fed where if you want something you have to communicate it. And also letting people know that they do have a voice and a say, you know, whenever you express that to the sport coaches themselves. But once you have value and you've delivered that time and time again, and that is seen by other people. I like the first thing you said where Jason said, here's what, here's where we need more coaches and here's why. Anyone can express what they need, what they want and all these other things. But if you can explain why it's necessary, why it's a win-win for everyone around, why there's value, it's not just like suiting what you want. Like you said, it's a team around a team. Adding more staff is so many implications, you know, but if you can say, here's what we need and why, that's gonna go a whole lot farther. So, very interesting. And moving on to our next question. So you being very familiar with Olympic weightlifting, with your own career, with multiple certifications that you have, let's say that you have a colleague that isn't as familiar or doesn't believe in the Olympic lifts. And this, this is just using Olympic weightlifting as an example. So someone that, doesn't necessarily believe or use your training methods. How do you go about that? And then second, how do you, how does a coach handle having potential training biases to methods that they use themselves as an athlete, or if they came from a previous school that mainly uses a certain type of training method? So how do you handle your own potential biases? And how do you handle colleagues that might not have the same training beliefs that you do? Um, well, 
Jason and I actually came from two different backgrounds. And, you know, he came, was a football player at Penn State, and they had a high intensity philosophy there. And he was familiar with Olympic weightlifting, and he was certified in Olympic weightlifting, but he defaulted to what he knew, as we all do, <laughs> you know. And then I came in with a Olympic weightlifting background, and, you know, him being, you know, my director, it was me saying, these are the lifts that I would like to do with my teams, and this is why I would like to do them. And it, it did take me, you know, defending, you know, my purpose to say, hey, like, I know that you don't use these as much as I would like to, but I think I would like to use them, and the coach is okay with me using them, so I want to do that. Um, so, I mean, we're all always going to kind of default to what we know, as we should. We should not be coaching things that we don't know. <laughs> so, I mean, going towards your bias is what you're hired to do, you know, um, at a very young stage in your professional career. As somebody that now hires staff, I welcome different philosophies. You know, we have um, a guy on staff that directly worked with Cal Dietz. And like I said earlier, <laughs> I don't want to read Cal Dietz's triphasic book. I want to do the program. <laughs> so I want to learn by doing. So I was like, this is going to be great. You know, he is going to write a program for me. And that's exactly what happened. I was like, write a program for me. I want to know how this works. And I want to physically do it because I know that you want to do it. And I know this is going to what you'll probably default to. And even through the interview process, I mean, when we hire a strength and conditioning coach, we ask them to bring in programming. We ask them and we have them, we look through it and we haven't, we ask them questions on, okay, like you don't work in Cal Dietz's program. So how's this going to work here at Princeton? You know, I mean, these are questions that we ask in the interview process. So someone doesn't come in thinking that I'm going to do what I did in the last place because that's all I know. And that's what I want to do. You know, um, these are, you know, so we sift through that process on, you know, the candidates that we bring in, but in general, I don't want to bring in people that know just what I know. I want to bring in people that are going to challenge me, are going to bring, you know, fresh ideas to the group and, you know, and give us the opportunity to grow so we can do chalk talks and learn. And now that I am, you know, I have a staff and, and not, I have six teams and I have a staff, you know, me digging into programming is hard for me to do time-wise. <laughs> you know, it, it's me. Now it's me like, okay, I have a staff, I have my teams, and, you know, these are the things I'm juggling. So when, you know, something new comes out or, you know, a new training philosophy or like, hey, if you check this out or even like a nutrition program, hey, if you check this out, it's usually the guys on my staff that bring it to like the group's attention. You know, not the same guy, but different guys. You know, we have a guy that worked with Cal Dietz. We had a guy that worked at Exos, you know. Um, so we have a very like diverse group of strength and conditioning coaches. And I feel like that's how we learn. You know, I don't want someone to be exactly like me. So, you know, there have been times that I'm like, you're, they're talking to me about something and I'm like, um, I wouldn't do that, you know, and this is why. Or there have been times when I've said that I heard you, you, did, you did this and it didn't hurt an athlete, but a coach heard you talk about it and, you know, they weren't pleased with it. So, and I wouldn't do that. And this is why, like, we're not trying to like experiment on our athletes, you know? So if you need to prove it, I need to see you do it on yourself before you do it with your athletes. So we're no experimentation process going on with the, with the athletes. So, I mean, I think that we should continue to, you know, evolve as a profession. We should evolve as strength and conditioning coaches. I'm, I'm a lifelong learner and I want to continue to learn. Like if I'm going to grow in this field, I mean, I have many years ahead of me here. So, and if I'm going to grow, I need to grow with what's going on. And, and I feel like it's like the younger staff that brings those fresh ideas and, you know, gets out of that old school way of thinking. Do I like linear periodization? Yes, I do. You know, I grew up with linear periodization. I'm Olympic weightlifter and, you know, there's many different ways to do Olympic weightlifting, but you know, the, the, it starts with linear periodization and then all these new programs kind of just break off some sort of linear periodization. All of it does, you know? So it's always like telling our interns, have an understanding of what landing your periodization is first before you try, you know, you start diving into these other programs. Um, you know, so, and, but I also know that there's other ways to do it. And I know that, you know, there's like, there's some kinks in the chain that you need to have an understanding of that's going to come up when you, when you're doing linear periodization or any other program. So, and, you know, so I don't turn away, turn my back away from staff that have new ideas. And um, I don't even turn my back away from athletes that have new ideas. Now, that's not saying that, 
you know, if an athlete comes in, no athletes come in and do their own programs. It's not, it doesn't work like that. But I will hear an athlete out if they have some experience, if they have some experience with something else. And, you know, I, it's give and take, it's give and take when it comes to buy-in. So, and, you know, maybe an athlete like, opens my eyes or I talk to their strength coach that they had in high school or I'm like, Oh, I like what they're doing. And I, and I develop a relationship that way. So um, I, I definitely think that, yes, I have a way personally of doing things, but when it comes to my staff, I'll certainly make them, you know, I'll ask questions and I'll have them, you know, defend some of their ideas, but I'm not going, I'm not strict in the sense where they have to do it my way. And with those biases, I like how you said, you have to acknowledge them and they do exist. And we like what's comfortable to us. It's kind of just how humans work. And you should have some success in what you've done. That's how you've gotten to where you are as an athlete. And also that's probably how you got the job that you did is because you've had success using those methods. But you said it three times, explain your why, defend it. You know, So it's acknowledging that those biases do exist for the right reasons for success but knowing that there are a ton of different ways to write a program and that everyone has these own different lenses formed from the different experiences from Cal East Texas to, to everything else and opening up that discussion, right? A closed mouth doesn't get fed. You gotta, you, you have to explain your why and together, you know, we can make our own programs, but then make each other's better along the way. And that's the point of being a staff, being a team around the team. So very cool. I like that answer a lot. I like that you keep saying team around the team. Yeah, I got that from you. I'm proud of you. <laughs> yeah, about 20 minutes ago, I got that from you. So I like that one. <laughs> Next. So you have a few certifications yourself. Well, you have a master's, but you're a master's strength and conditioning coach. You are a USAW senior coach level two, as well as a top Totten. Is that how you say Totten. it? Which Totten. is Totten, another Olympic weightlifting certification. So as certifications are kind of this, they're basically the standard nowadays. It's what the strength, strength and conditioning field has. How do you educate a young or experienced coach on navigating what certifications to pursue? Why? Basically just this context of there's money implications. It's not just the certifications, but what you do with it. So kind of just having multiple certifications yourself, your own perspective on how to navigate and kind of thinking about certifications in the field. Sure. Well, the NCAA requires you to be you know, certified. <laughs> so you have to do that if you want to be in college strength and conditioning. I don't think that they specify exactly which certifications you have to have. Don't quote me on that. Um, but it's the CSCS now. Okay. Um, so that's the first step. I mean, if you want to be in collegiate strength and conditioning, we all had the CSCS first. I don't know one person that didn't have CSCS first. I mean, that is baseline certification. And that is what I tell our interns, ones that are, you know, senior in college or graduate assistant, whatever level intern we get, if they don't have that, I'm like, get your CSCS, get your CSCS. And then I'm, I'm like, if you really want to get into collegiate strength and conditioning, then I'm like, you need to get your SCCC. And I explain the reason why, because, I mean, it, it validates you as a clay strength and conditioning coach even more. It, get, it says that you actually have an understanding, not of just the science and some movement biomechanics and techniques, but the actual big picture of what clay strength and conditioning is about. And that goes from, you know, yes, you have to write a program. You have to defend your program. You have to demonstrate movements. You have to do an internship under a master strength and conditioning coach. So there's many levels of requirements for that certification to actually get it. And I, and I, and I think that that validates, you know, the process even more. So those are the two that I definitely would say get it. We just had an intern circuit call this week was in Olympic weightlifting um, and Mike Gatone spoke on, on the intern circuit and he talked about the USA weightlifting certification. I'm like, listen, I told our interns and I will say this a thousand times. Yes, you can learn how to do Olympic weightlifting without getting certified. But I re recommend that if, if you're going to give athletes that in their program, then I suggest you get that certification. I know it's not required, but I suggest you get it. We want to have universal language. And USA Weightlifting provides universal language. Like CrossFit has kind of like stolen some things from USA Weightlifting and kind of made their own terms on how to do things. And, and, and people are confused 
because of CrossFit has given USA weightlifting popularity, but I mean, they've kind of like taken some of our turns and made, made it their own. So I, I like that USA weightlifting, I mean, from the beginning of the sport has certain lifts and they're taught a certain way. And, you know, these are the terms of the different lifts. These are what you call these different lifts. And then, I mean, obviously cueing is going to be different, but I, you know, I believe it, that we need to have universal term language and, um, and that's a great start. And also the certification, it's not only classroom material, like you physically, you go out, you have a, you know, one of the instructors is, coaching you through the lifts, you're, again, you're doing the actual lifts. Um, and, and I think that that's baseline. So I would definitely say CSCS, SCCC, and USA Weightlifting certifications. The other ones, um, the Totten certification, like, or the Totten certification, like Leo Totten was my weightlifting coach and he created, I mean, he is a USA Weightlifting coach, but he also created his own certification. And I got that one as well. You know, I mean, I'm an Olympic weightlifter. <laughs> so I just, I mean, I know a lot of people come out with their certifications. I mean, <clears throat> he's not only my coach, but he's a personal friend of mine. And I think that, I mean, he's a valuable teacher. He was an Olympic weightlifter and, you know, he's a valuable teacher in the field. So I believe that um, I stand behind his certification as well. So, I mean, I don't think you need to go out and just get every certification just to have dump letters behind your name, though, you know? Um, I, I think that you do want some letters behind your name, you know, and you have to have certain letters behind your name. But I mean, I think that it's just valuable to get not necessarily certifications, but get education. And, you know, sometimes with that becomes a certification, you know, I mean, I think when you think certification, there's some sort of testing that's involved. So yeah, you can go to a seminar and you can learn, you can go to a conference and you can learn, but with a certification, there's some sort of testing involved. And I, and I think that that takes it to the next level. So, I mean, I, I would never discourage anybody to get, like not to get anything. I, I would just, I would just say, um, you know, the baseline ones again are the CSCS for sure. And then SCCC. And then if you're going to do the Olympic lifts, you should probably get USA weightlifting, at least USA weightlifting level one. And with those three that you mainly mentioned, it wasn't, it wasn't just to get it because those are the standards. Well, the CSCS, that was the why. Moral of my story is you explain the why and the context for all of it. The CSCS, I call it like the driver's license of coaching. It doesn't make you a good coach, but at the end of the day, that's the standard. The, the CS, uh, the collegiate the one, sorry. The SCCC. Okay, a lot of C's and S's. That's if you want to be more legitimate in the collegiate strength, strength and conditioning field. Don't get it just because it has to have a purpose to you and your goal and your coaching. In the USCW, if Princeton uses a lot of Olympic lifts, then that's the reason to get it if you work there. And so it's, if you do your research, you know what it takes because all of them are going to have different qualifications and processes and some stuff is in person stuff, some stuff is all self-study. But if you know what it takes and you know why you're doing it and how you're going to use it, it's really not the letters. It's what you do with it. So moral of that story. So very cool. And then last two questions. We'll touch on these briefly. So how would you describe your coaching style now briefly, but more importantly, what has changed over the years? High expectations. I'm um, very direct and I give a lot of tough love. Um, I always explain to my athletes, I'm, you know, I'm like, I, I'm like a prickly porcupine on the outside sometimes, but I'm a teddy bear on the inside. <laughs> um, it, it's the high expectations part. Like I, I know that there's still now that athletes are sometimes are afraid to approach, not afraid to approach me, but some athletes just don't even want to like say things to me, not because they're afraid I'm going to be mad at them because I have these high expectations for them and they, they're afraid to let me down. Like, I, I get that from coaches. Coaches like, oh, they didn't want to tell you because they didn't want to let you down. And it's, that's not necessarily a bad thing. I just want them to be able to talk to me, you know? And, and, and that's still work that I need to do because I, I need to be approachable. And it's not that I'm not approachable. It's just, again, like, I have, they know I have these high expectations and they don't want to let me down. Um, and, I, and I think that, but what has changed more importantly, as you said, over the time I said tough love and what has changed is I give more love now and less tough. And, and, and it's me creating that relatability. It's that vulnerability and transparency of myself and me not being like, I'm the strength coach, I'm demanding these things. I mean, we all are demanding, but it, it, it's my physical approach, it's my approachability. And, 
you know, and, and my energy that I bring to the fact of like those small things, like it, it went from, and I mean, I'm sure we all made these mistakes and, you know, maybe not, maybe, but, you know, it went from me saying, hey, like, I can help you. Like, why are you not doing this? Like, get better, <laughs> you know, or why should I pat you on the back for something you're supposed to do anyway? You know, those types of things to saying, hey, listen, like, I recognize that you worked very hard for this and, and you achieved your goal. Or I recognize that you've worked very hard for this and you're not quite there yet, but we can get you there. And this is how. So those are the ways I think just I, I'm still me. Like, I'm, I'm still direct. And I know that. And it and it's, makes me, like, kind of smirk when athletes, like, walk in and they're just like, hi, Angie. <laughs> um and because they know that they're going to be like, okay, like we're going to get going today. So we want to see kind of lightly, you know, is Angie like going to be Angie or is she like ready to go? <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm always ready to go, but um, I, I think that they're always kind of, you know, sometimes a little weary and, and it's like, it's early in the morning. So like, is this going to be hard, hard Angie, or is this going to be like light and fluffy? So um, I think that, me recognizing those differences in myself though, in an area that I still need to improve, it, it, it's there, you know, it's, it's me saying, hey, listen, like I need to, you know, regardless of what my own personal mood is, I need to come out and say, hey, listen, like number one, you can talk to me at any time. And number two, I don't care if I'm happy or mad, I still demand the same, I still am demanding the same expectations. And so I would definitely say, I mean, I think we all have high expectations of their athletes. Um, and, you know, so, I mean, there's nothing new there, but um, that would probably be my coaching style when it comes to what I'm doing. And I, and I think it's with my staff as well. And I guess I might steal your next one of your questions, but when it comes to the staff, and I, I think that I'm still learning that. Because, you know, I went from, you know, being their college, like some of the people on our staff, I mean, I was working with them and then it was me leading them. And that's a different relationship. That was, that was a tough transition. Um, I mean, it worked out wonderfully, but it was a tough transition. And um, leadership is not easy. Like, and I'm not talking about leadership to athletes. I'm talking about like leadership to a staff. Um, and because I want them all to grow. And I, I think that, you know, but it's, it's me separating myself from like Angie, I'm the director of strength and conditioning from Angie, I'm the strength and conditioning coach of these teams. And I want my staff to feel like we're a team and we're a family. And I want them to be able to come to me for any, for anything. I like really, when it comes to them, I just, I want to empower them and I want them to have autonomy. You know, obviously they can come to me if they have issues. Um, obviously, like if they're going to go do something that's going to affect the whole department, like I want them to run it by me, but it, it's not like I want them to be creative in their own thoughts and, and grow as people and as professionals as well. Um, so I don't really know where I was going with that. I just kind of went from athlete rate to my staff, but um, it's not, it, it, it's hard on both ends really. And, you know, my stat, my job is a little unique in where most directors of strength and conditioning do coach other teams. I am not, I'm not saying that, um, but I have six <laughs> and, you know, and I have a staff of five. So, and I'm new at the game when it comes to being a leader to that staff. So it's not, I'm not great at it yet. Like I'm reading books all the time on it. Like I'm, I'm finding new ways to communicate with my staff. I, did a manager certificate program, like, and it's not it's just about reading books. You actually have to apply what you're reading. Um, and you also need to be like, I can't do th this might not work in my organization. Like I need to just like a program where you're like, I can't take somebody else's program and implement it right into my program. I can't just take what I'm reading and implement it directly into my program. I have to sift through some things to like be able to make it applicable. But um, I think it's a constant learning process. Leading is not an easy thing to do, nor do I think it should be. Um, but I, I, I wanted to, I hate saying that when one of my staff, they're like, oh, Angie, she's our boss. I'm like, Ooh, don't call me the boss. Like, I don't like, I don't like that term. Um, and even like the word supervisor, I just, it just, I just, I want to be considered like one of the people that they're working with. And like, yes, like I might, it's like going to an older sister, I guess, but I don't want them to be like, she's our boss, you know? And I, and I think that a lot of younger folks are, you know, kind of, that's how they see it a lot of ways. And I just, I, I personally don't, I mean, there's other people that lead direct differently than I do, but 
um, yeah, well, I'm the one that does, you know, their, their midterm reviews and their annual reviews, like we're teammates. And I want to touch on the progression quickly before we move on to our last question. And I think that all starts with awareness and being able to ask yourself some of those tougher questions like, was that too much tough? Was that too much love? Or I don't really like how the interaction went. Like, why didn't it go that well? Or being aware enough to where it's like, okay, my coworkers are now technically under me, even though you said that that's not how you want it to be. But that relationship does change and having that awareness that it did change. You know, and, and that first day that you walk in as director, you probably can't do and say the same things that you would say as, as when they were your coworkers. So having that awareness to know what situation you're in, but also ask yourself those questions kind of after the fact of, I like that. Why did it work out? Well, I didn't like that. Why didn't it work out? And uh, being able to ask and answer those questions, if I had to, to try to sum up your answer. Yeah, I mean, vulnerability is a huge thing. Not just, I mentioned it about, you know, being vulnerable and transparent with our athletes. I think it's just as important, if not more important, to be vulnerable and transparent with your staff. And like I said earlier, I hire staff. I essentially hire staff that know things that I don't know. And that, if you have a, a big ego, that could really bother you. You're like, I mean, because I'm not going to, sometimes I'm like, okay, I have to dig into this because they know this and I might not know it. And I'm okay with that. Like our, you know, if you think from like the top level down, like we don't, our AD doesn't know every single aspect of what every sport coach does. I mean, she wants all our, you know, coaches to be like CEOs of their own programs. And, and I feel the same way, but I can also learn from them. Like I, I, I let the, I have my staff write my personal exercise programs because I just kind of want to know what they do and how they kind of dig into things. And, um, I don't like, sometimes I'm like, I wish I knew that because, you know, <laughs> I don't want to come across as I don't know, but I'm just like, Hey, I don't know this, <laughs> you know, and you do. So teach me. And that's part of me saying, I want to grow and I want you to grow, but I want you to have autonomy and I still need to learn. Fantastic. So I feel like that might trickle into our next question. We got about five or so minutes left. If you had to give a three, four bullet point summary on how you create buy-in with your athletes and staff? With athletes, I feel I need to earn their trust. I, I know that, you know, it's that coach-athlete relationship and athlete, you know, some coaches think that athletes automatically should be, quote unquote, respecting them. I don't think that that's how it works. I think that, yes, when you walk in the door, they give you a certain level of respect because you're in a specific position, but to get real trust you have to earn it from the athletes and through that i think you need to number one be confident <laughs> in what you're doing um i think you need to have energy you need to be uh what i'm trying to think the word i'm trying to think of um consistent and i and i think that's what my athletes love mostly about me when it comes to my expectations my expectations are always consistent you know, and then all the other things, I mean, getting to know the athletes and again, vulnerability and transparency. So definitely competency and consistency are my number two biggest things when it comes to earning an athlete's trust. And it's not an easy thing to do, but, and, and personalities have a lot to have a lot to do with it as well, but there's no magic there's no magic to, you know, earning the trust of an athlete and everybody's differently. Like you have to dig into their personalities. You have to get to know them. And I mean, what, what's the saying when they say like athletes um, or anybody, like they don't care what you know, unless they know you care. So, and I think that that's very important, you know? So, I mean, you have to be in there. Like this is a lifestyle. What we do is a lifestyle. It is who we are. So, you know, dig in. Fantastic. Now, opening up the floor to you, where can the listeners get more of you? Mm, what do you mean? Like social media? Social or? media, if they want to get in touch, if you post anything. Oh, sure. Um, well, on Instagram, my um, strength girl <laughs> is my Instagram handle. Um, I mean, my email, or my, phone, my phone number, anything they want. If anyone wants to get in touch with me, any of those ways, for sure, reach out. You know, I mean, did you want me to give him my email right now or? Yeah. What's your email? 
Um, it's Brambley, B-R-A-M-B-L-E-Y at Princeton.edu. Fantastic. And that is all for today. Thank you, much, thank you very much for your time. I'm glad we were able to knock this out and some awesome stories. And I'm sure that the listener got a lot of value out of it. So thank you very much. Thank you.